the sky is always falling. So what I would like this afternoon to be is essentially a form of group therapy, because we need it, okay? Because they're scaring us with these stories about how it's unpatriotic, how it's burdening the next generation, how it's dooming us to a future of higher taxes, catastrophe for the nation, right? And I wanna try to lower the temperature, get us to the point where we can, at whatever age it's legal to do so, open a nice bottle of red wine, read the newspaper, see the headline, national debt is at an all-time high, and have that nice glow about us and feel at peace with the world, right? There's no reason to panic. The government's budget is nothing like a household budget. This is the problem. They're not like us. Their budget doesn't work the way our budgets work. Deficit spending by the federal government isn't the same as you and I spending more than we make year after year. Borrowing by the federal government isn't the same as you and I going out and putting money on a credit card. One of us issues the currency. They do. The other one of us, you and I, are merely using the US dollar. So we have a distinction to make between currency issuers and currency users. The issuer of the currency, the federal government in this case, can never run out of it, can never go broke, can never have bills coming due that it can't afford to pay, can't become insolvent, can't end up like people you may know, right, who took on too much debt and got into trouble and were forced into bankruptcy. My deficit, my red ink, is your black ink. Okay, here it is with actual historical data for the US going back to 1960. The red line is my account balance. Okay, the red line is my financial balance. The black line is the private sector in the US. It's all the households, it's all the businesses in the US combined. And what do you notice? I'm almost always in the red, my budget is almost always in deficit, and yours is almost always in surplus. And not only that, they tend to move opposite one another. Meaning, when I run bigger deficits, you all end up with bigger surpluses, okay? So my red ink is your black ink. So when you see a headline like this one, right, from the Wall Street Journal just a few days ago, trillion dollar deficits could be the new normal. This is meant to shock and frighten. Trillion dollar deficits could be the new normal, but take a breath and read it this way. Watch the word deficit. Don't you feel better? Don't you feel better? The national debt is all of the outstanding treasury bonds that the government spent the money into the economy, didn't tax it back, and then traded the cash for a different financial instrument called a, a security a government bond, okay? So the entire national debt is nothing more than a record, a historical record of all of the dollars that were spent into the economy, not taxed back, and are currently being held in the form of US treasuries. That's all the national debt is. What do we really owe China? So I have a friend who's a bond trader. Uh, he's a fixed income guy, trades uh, government bonds. And his name is Warren Mosler. And Warren will often say, the only thing we owe China is a bank statement. Okay, it's, he's being a little bit funny, but essentially at the end of the day, that's about it. Okay, what do we owe China? A bank statement. Okay, we already got the stuff. We traded it for a treasury, and at the end of the day, as long as China wants to orient its economy around exporting in order to grow, in order to create jobs, then we're the beneficiary in this bargain. Eliminating the national debt means eliminating all of those safe securities called U.S. treasuries that people like to hold in their portfolios because that's what the national debt is. You pay off the debt, you eliminate the debt, there are no more treasury securities anywhere. They're done. So why does that happen? Why does something that sounds so good and fiscally responsible running some budget surpluses and paying down debt, why does it tend to coincide with 
bad economic consequences? Why do we end up with depressions in the Great Recession? And very quickly, because we could talk for an hour just about, I could, about this picture. Uh, but I want to just show you, this is, this is where we were with Bill Clinton. That is the government's budget moving into surplus. You can see the red. That's the government's deficit. Government's almost always in deficit. But there were those four years right there under Bill Clinton when the government's budget moved into surplus. And there was great celebration, right? This is the first time in generations that the budget has been in surplus. This is the fiscally responsible thing to do. You know, Democrats delivered this. Well, yeah, but guess what? Look what happened to the private sector's financial position. Right, it was the built on the backs of the private sector. The private sector's financial balance went deeply in the red, and that's what allowed the public sector's balance to move temporarily into the black. But it didn't last, and it can't last. Why? Because it was driven by primarily households spending more than their income, borrowing on the back of a dot-com bubble and then a housing bubble, and eventually the whole thing unravels. Too much debt, mostly for households. Inflation is every central banker's public enemy number one. That's what he's worried about. Okay, so can you imagine if instead of saying Social Security is going broke, we have to cut benefits, the system is unsustainable, forget all of that. If instead of that, we were saying, what are the things that we can do today? What are the investments we can make today to increase the odds that in 5, 10, 20 years, the U.S. economy is productive enough that we can make good on all of those promises without causing an inflation problem. The Republicans would say what? Tax cuts and deregulation are the best ways to produce an economy that is you know, maximum growth and high productivity. And the Democrats would say what? Education, infrastructure, R&D. But at least we would be having the right debate. Right? At least we would be having a good, constructive, productive debate over the real issues that matter instead of this phony, you know, where the money is running out sort of debate. The U.S. government is never going to run out of the U.S. dollar. The U.S. government is the scorekeeper for the dollar. It can't run out of dollars any more than a carpenter can run out of inches, or the scorekeeper here at Stony Brook can run out of points when the football team is putting up 77 points in a game, and all the fans are sitting in the audience going, oh my god, what happens if they score again? They're never going to have enough points to put up. Yes, they will. They can't run out. The stadium can't run out of points. The U.S. government can't run out of dollars. It's a unit, right? The government spends by instructing its bank to change the numbers in someone's account upward. That's how we pay for things. It's not actually by physically printing money and making payments. It's all done electronically. This is the debate I wish we were having. Instead of getting bogged down in the pay for a question, focus on the real things that matter. What can we afford? The answer isn't in financial terms. The answer is in real terms. If we want to do a trillion dollars of infrastructure and somebody says, how are you going to pay for it? You should say, I'm going to pay for it by hiring 300,000 construction workers by using X tons of steel, by using two or three percent of our unused spare capacity in our factories, by mobilizing this many machines and heavy equipment, and so that's how you pay for it. Real resources, and if you don't have them, if the economy is already operating at full employment and everybody's being used, all the workers are already employed, all the resources are currently being used, then you can't afford it, right? But if you have spare capacity, if you have idle people, if you have idle machines, if the raw materials are there, then the government can step in and say, now would be a good time because we can mobilize these resources in a responsible way. That means without causing inflation, without competing for those resources with other people who are currently using. They're not being used. We can hire them, put them to work, and improve the standard of living, right, in the interest of the public, of the public good. So thank you very much. Thank you.